Well, hello and welcome again to another broadcast of the Renewed Covenant Fellowship. I'm your host, Brother David Jones, and we're glad to be with you again tonight. We were not with you last week as we were out of state and we're traveling uh, uh, out with some friends uh, down in the Daytona Beach area. And uh, But we are glad to be back with you tonight on Friday night, the last the last night of, of uh, January 2020. It's hard to believe that the, the month of January has already gone by. It just absolutely just uh, zips right on by. And uh, we're going to let some folks get a chance to get online tonight. And uh, we put out some uh, notifications. Uh, Shalom Akalem, their brother Keith, Miss Sheila, appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, we, we're glad to be back uh, with you online. Hello, brother Jeremy. And. Um, Share this to your page and uh, let folks know that uh, you're you're uh, online and in the study tonight. Um, believe it's going to be very good tonight. We're going to be talking out of First Corinthians twelve out of spiritual things and um, a lot of uh, misunderstandings in Scripture concerning these things. A lot of false teaching that takes place uh, chapter 12 13 and 14 especially in first corinthians very telling uh, deals with a lot of uh, things that were going on within the corinthian church and things that are done incorrectly within uh, modern christianity today and so uh, make sure you got your bible and uh, we're going to be getting into that here just shortly but uh, we are glad to be back uh, we did uh, go down to daytona beach uh, spent some time with our friends down there brother rick and grace crouch and the good folks there at the seventh day baptist church there in daytona beach and appreciate the opportunity we had to sing and to teach them some scripture songs last week and uh, hello, Brother Daniel and uh, Brother Paul and Miss Tina. Appreciate you guys joining us tonight. Share this to your page and let folks know that uh, we've got a Bible study going on. Again, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 12 tonight. So we hope that you've got your Bible and your, your notes and your pencils and things like that. Uh, we do know there's a lot of hubbub and things going on within the country right now and a lot of things taking place. Uh, up in Washington, D.C. And, I, and I'll, I'll just tell you right now, there are distractions. There are distractions to the gospel. There are distractions to the ministry. Uh, there are distractions for believers. I can tell you that right now because Satan wants nothing more than to pull the wool over our eyes and uh, uh, cause us to not look at truth. Hello, Miss Kay. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, and so, so many times um, we miss out on things by, by having our eyes closed and having our, our, uh, the blinders on, if you will. We're going to be talking a little bit about that tonight uh, uh, as Paul deals with his letter. And um, yes, uh, Bro Paul, Miss Tina, appreciate you guys. I uh, hope you have a great Shabbat as well. Looking forward to Sabbath. Looking forward to being back with our, our folks tomorrow uh, at 2 uh, p.m. Looking forward to that. So uh, we hope that, that uh, you'll be in your place of worship wherever you are located. Amen. Well, let's open up in prayer tonight. Ask the Father's blessing on, on, on the meeting and on the study as we get right into the teaching time tonight. Father, we are so thankful for yet another time that we can uh, open up your word. Father, that we can take the time and the responsibility to try to expound on its pages. Father, we do not uh, claim tonight to have all the answers. So, Father, we're just frail human beings that are trying our best to understand your word. Father, I just pray may your word return uh, not return void, but that it would accomplish exactly what it set out to do tonight. I pray for those that will be watching uh, by way of YouTube and by way of Facebook, Father, that they would receive a blessing and that we would learn something from your word. Father, that we'd be able to put aside a lot of religious garbage and religious nonsense. And Father, and just go back to what scripture says. Father, we do pray for those that will be watching. We ask you, may your Holy Spirit move in our midst and do for us what needs to be done. Save a soul that's nearest destruction tonight. And Father, that you'd uh, reclaim backsliders. And Father, that you'd do a great work in our midst. 
Thank you again for your mercy and kindness. Now meet with us tonight, I pray, in the name of Yeshua Messiah, our Master and Savior, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Well, we've got the mans with us, Shelly and Doug. Appreciate you guys being with us. Share this to your page right now, and let's get some folks online, and we will uh, hopefully be able to uh, learn some things tonight. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and, and this is where Paul sort of changes gears. He's gone from his rebuke uh, concerning the, the Lord's table uh, and at the Passover, and now he's coming into, and, and of course we've titled it Spiritual Things. That's what the Bible says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in his letter. I'm going to read the letter from the Peshitta tonight. Now, as we've said before, the Peshitta is the Aramaic uh, uh, New Testament writings. The Aramaic letters uh, comes from about 150 A.D. It is where our English Bible comes from. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that we get our Bible from the Peshitta. I have a Peshitta that is has been translated directly from Aramaic to English, uh, and it really helps us to understand a lot more uh, what Paul is talking about. So I'm going to read from the Peshitta, but I'm going to try as I read to try to expound uh, from the English to help you understand the differences and the nuances uh, that's going on. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll begin reading uh, right there in verse number 1. He says, But about spiritual things, my brethren, I want you to know that you were pagans and you were being led without discrimination to those idols which have no voice. Now our English Bible, especially the authorized Bibles, uh, call, calls them dumb idols. And that's talking about idols that could not speak. He goes on in verse 3, but because I inform you of this, there is no man who speaks by the spirit of Elohim and says Yeshua is damned or cursed. Neither can a man say Yeshua is the Lord Yahweh except by the spirit of holiness. Now I want to stop right there just for a second. Now I know there's a lot of argument uh, and a lot of things going around the internet and around the, the um, Torah keeping communities and things like that. I want to, people want to argue about the deity of, of Messiah. Uh, our English Bible says or says uh, that Yeshua is Lord or Master. The word Master here, 2962, comes from the Greek word kurios, which simply means supreme authority. Okay, but the Peshitta actually calls him Yeshua the Lord Yahweh or the Lord Yehovah um, yod heh vav -He, okay hello bro brother Jason appreciate you joining us tonight and so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 it really brings out the deity of the Messiah that Yeshua Jesus Christ is Elohim he is God in the flesh okay and uh, people want to try to get an explanation well how can he be the father how can he be Yahweh you know, Isaiah called him the everlasting father. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but I know that the scripture plainly teaches right here. Uh, uh, um, yes, that's right. Marya is used in the Peshitta, Lord Yehovah or Lord Yahweh. Okay. And so when you look at what the Bible says and how the Bible teaches us and how the Bible uh, shows us here in scripture uh, that is uh, except, he says, uh, neither can a man say Yeshua is the Lord Yahweh except by the spirit of holiness or spirit of, of Elohim. Uh, and it is the spirit that shows us and teaches us that we are or, or that Yeshua is Elohim. Yeshua is Yahweh. Now we can't understand that. Many times we can't understand it and we can't wrap our head around that and we can't fathom that because we want everything to be fit in a nice neat little box. But we can't we can't put the creator in a box. We just can't do that. And we find many times even in the Old Testament, even in the book of Genesis, where we find that Yahweh manifested himself in human form, especially when he was talking to Abraham. Okay. So let me, let me continue reading on. He's in, in verse number four. said, but there are diversities of gifts. However, the spirit is one. 
and there are diversities of ministries. However, the Lord Yahweh is one. Now that goes right back to the Shema there in Deuteronomy chapter number uh, six, verses four through nine. Uh, the uh, uh, Yahweh is one. Okay, where he says there, um, uh, "Hear, O Israel." Uh, the Lord our God, the Lord, he is one. And so when you look at that, that's just a, ref a reference back to the, um, the Torah there in Deuteronomy chapter number six. Let me, let me continue reading on. He says in verse number six, and there is a diversity of miracles, but Elohim is one who works all in every person. But the revelation of the spirit is given to each man as he helps him. There is given to him by the Spirit a word of wisdom, but to another the word of knowledge by the Spirit, to another faith by the Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the Spirit, and to another miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another discernment of spirits, to another kinds of languages, to another translation of languages, but all these things that one Spirit does and distributes to every person as he pleases. And as we understand this and we see this, I want to stop right there in verse number 11, and I want to try to expound on this just for a little bit, uh, talking about these different gifts of the Spirit that Paul is bringing out uh, in, the, uh, in the English Bible. Uh, it says, uh, for one is for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now that word wisdom just simply means uh, the proper application of knowledge. That's what wisdom is. Being wise is the proper application of knowledge. And that is a spiritual gift. It is not something that we just uh, uh, are, are we can pick up in a Bible college or we can pick up at, at, a, at a Sabbath meeting. But wisdom comes simply from the Father. And it is the proper application of knowledge. You can have a lot of knowledge. I mean, I mean, I use this illustration a lot. You can know that the speed limit is 55, but if you drive 100 and have a wreck, that wasn't very wise, okay? So wisdom and knowledge go hand in hand, but you can have a lot of knowledge and not be very wise. There's a lot of scholars and a lot of scientists that have a lot of knowledge, but they're not very wise. And wisdom, uh, as we've said before, is the proper application of knowledge. And Paul says there uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 verse number nine. Eight, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. And it is simply the proper application of knowledge. He goes on to say to another the word of knowledge. Knowledge would be general intelligence and understanding. And, and that too is a gift of being able to retain knowledge, being able to uh, have intelligence and being able to understand and have a general understanding. He goes on to say there uh, that uh, to another, faith by the same spirit. Now, remember, we're talking about spiritual things. Uh, so many people, I, and, I, and I want you to understand this, just because you have a gift of the spirit does not mean that you're going to have every gift. Does not mean that. The scripture is very clear that he gives to some, some uh, one, one gift or, or some gifts and to others different gifts so that the body may be uh, perfect and so it may grow and so it may flourish together. Uh, he says there in verse number nine, to another faith by the same spirit. Okay. Uh, let's see. The question was, Miss Kay said, what about a word of knowledge when you hear something about someone you don't know? Hmm, that's going to get into just down the road just a little bit. Hold on just a second to that thought, because I think we're going to get to that here in just, in just a second. Verse number nine, to another faith by the same spirit. Now, faith is simply assurance or belief or the conviction of a truth. Do you know that faith is a verb? 
Faith is not a noun. It's not a thing. It's not a person, place, or thing. But it's actually a verb. It's an action word. Uh, James says, faith without works is dead. And so when you look at what the scripture says, faith is something that comes uh, as a gift. Okay. Um, what is a, a Hebrews 11 um, just came to my mind. Let me turn to it here real quick. I want to read that Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it is a gift that comes by the Spirit. And then we practice our faith by the working of the Spirit. We put our faith into practice by the work of the Spirit. We put our faith into action by the work of the Spirit. We follow the commandments and the instructions of our Heavenly Father by faith. We walk out the Torah by faith. We conduct ourselves on a daily basis by faith, which is a gift of the Spirit. <clears throat> He goes on to say there in verse number nine, he said to another, the gifts of healing by the same spirit. Now, all of these words I looked up in the concordance and I'm just basically giving you the information that, that you will find in your own concordance and in your own study. Uh, if you find something that I'm saying that is incorrect, please, please make sure to bring that out. But here the word healing is remedies and medicines. Now, how many have noticed the remedies that are all over the internet today with natural remedies and holistic medicines and and uh, uh, things concerning uh, let you know let's just bring it out you know the the oils and the young living and and those types of things uh, there's a lot of that going on. CBD products and you know all ty types of things and I'm a firm believer that natural remedies are what Yahweh wants for us to live by not uh, yes it is insane yeah but not by uh, injections and man-made drugs and man-made prescription. I'm I'm afraid. I'm I'm scared to death to 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 get sick and have to go get a prescription uh, because you know gel caps are made with uh, with pork and they put uh, all types of chemicals and all types of ungodly things within uh, um, uh, vaccinations and things like that and so when you when you look at what the what the Bible says that having the gift of healings goes to remedies and medicines and having the ability I remember my grandmother my grandmother she had all kind of concoctions now those old timers of my my grandmother grandparents were mountain people okay and they had they did old time remedies like my my son got stung by a bee one time well grandpa had a chewed tobacco actually i think it was either grandpa no it wasn't grandpa but it was miss sharon's uncle did this but i saw my grandfather do the same thing had a chew of tobacco in his mouth chewed it up real good slapped it on the bee sting wrapped it up and it sucked the poison out my grandmother, I watched my grandmother talk the fire out of a burn. And, and a lot of people say, well, that's witchcraft. All she was doing was blowing hot air on it. But what it was doing is it was taking the sting out of the burn. It's a natural remedy. There are so many natural remedies. Uh, what about the best cough medicine in the world? The best cough medicine in the world is whiskey, lemon, and honey. It's the best cough medicine in the world, okay? We don't need drugs and we don't need all the chemicals. That's just real simple. Three ingredients, some whiskey or bourbon and lemon and honey, best cough medicine in the world. And when you look at what the scripture says, the scripture is very clear that that is a gift that comes from the spirit to teach us how to heal ourselves and how to correct the things going on in our body naturally instead of through medicines and through... Have you guys figured out how much it costs to go to a doctor these days? 
I don't have insurance except through the VA and Miss Sharon don't have any insurance and and we're just praying praying to the Father that we that we're able to stay healthy. I mean it's just that simple. Um, let, let's let's move on. Verse number ten <clears throat> says to another the working of miracles. Now this one was a little vague. Okay, the best I could come up with was just simply the ability to do miracles. Okay, and so uh, I don't have any better answer than that because that's what was in the concordance and that's the way it came up uh, uh, in in the concordance. Just the ability to do miracles is a spiritual gift. Uh, the next one, though, I want to I want to hang on for just a little bit. He says to another prophecy. Now, this one means predictions or proclamations of divine inspiration. Now, Paul goes on, and we're going to read this on later on throughout the chapter. Paul goes on to talk about the order or things that are given to the assembly and the different, uh, the different structures there. Let me just go ahead and read ahead of it uh, a little, little bit there in verse number, <clears throat> chapter number 12 and verse number 28. For Elohim has set first in his assembly apostles, after them prophets, after them teachers, after them miracle workers, after them gifts of healings, helpers, leaders, different languages. Are they all apostles? Are they all prophets? Are they all teachers? Are they all miracle workers? And so there he gives a, he gives a list of, of, of how he set them within the assembly. But when you look at what a prophet is, a prophet is not only a foreteller, but he is also a forth teller. Now, I want you to look over to Deuteronomy chapter 13. We're going to go to the Torah on this one. Deuteronomy chapter number 13. This is what's called the Deuteronomy 13 test. Now, there's a lot of preachers out there, but there's a lot of false preachers out there, too. They'll stand up and they can holler and shout and scream and snort and run uh, uh, with the best of them, but they're false preachers, false teachers. They're they're preaching a false doctrine, and I'm going to show you right here in the scriptures uh, what the Bible says about that. We have a lot of lot of lot of watchers tonight. We welcome all of you to the broadcast tonight, and we hope that that you will join us uh, with your Bibles open. And if you have any questions, some of you guys that are that are helping me out there, maybe you can answer some questions for me tonight. Miss Sharon had to step out, and so I don't have anybody monitoring the other the other other computer. So Deuteronomy 13, verse number one <clears throat> says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, let us go after other gods or other mighty ones which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that that dreamer of dreams for Yahweh your Elohim proveth you to know whether you love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all, with all your soul. But also look over to Deuteronomy 18.20. Deuteronomy 18.20. Deuteronomy 18.20. And verse number, ver, uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other mighty ones or other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, I have been preaching since 1988, okay? And I will, I will be the first to admit that I have preached things that God, Yahweh, did not say. I've repented of those things, and I try now, I try my best not to open my mouth what first Yahweh don't put something in it, okay? I'm not perfect. I'll tell you right now, I still make, make mistakes, but there's preachers out there that'll stand in the pulpit and they'll tell you, uh, they'll tell you things like uh, Jesus or, or, or God uh, changed the Sabbath to Sunday. That's a lie. That's a lie straight out of the pits of hell. Okay, they'll stand in the pulpit and say, you don't have to do those feast days because those are for the Jews. That's a lie straight out of hell. It is a lie. You don't have to eat clean because we can eat anything we want to. We can eat bats and rats and cats and dogs and we can get coronavirus all day long. <clears throat> That's a lie straight out of hell. 
you, you don't have to do those things because, you know, Paul got rid of all that junk. Paul got rid of all that stuff. Paul got rid. Jesus nailed that to the, to the cross, and we don't have to do that no more. That's a bold-faced line. It's straight out of the pit, pits of hell. That's a false teacher. It's a false preacher. Okay? And when you have false preachers and you have false teachers that violate their oath of office, if you want to call it that, and they violate what they have promised that they will do was preach the word straight out of the book, then what you have is you have a false teacher. Look over to Matthew 24 and verse 24. Yeshua himself indicted many of these false teachers. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. Matthew 24 and verse 24. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets or false preachers and shall show great signs and wonders. Let's stop right there. There's, there's preachers, there's uh, evangelists, televangelists, pastors that have a great uh, uh, power of oration. They can talk. They can they can uh, handle the crowds and and they can they can manage the crowds and they can what what we call in the ministry work the crowd. They can do that. They have that ability and they have that talent. Okay. They're great speakers, okay, and they speak with great swelling words. The Bible says, Yeshua says, that they're going to be able to do great signs and wonders. How many, how many people are deceived each day by the Benny Hens and the Kenneth Copelands and the, 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 uh, uh, the Joel Osteens and the false teachers and false preachers uh, that are all through the world? That's right. That's, that's right, Brother Daniel. Matthew chapter 5, 17 to 20. Uh, uh, and also Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, 22, and 23, okay? Facebook, now wait a minute, Miss Shelley, I, I have a Facebook ministry. Miss Shelley just slammed me, amen? <laughs> We, we look at those things and, and they, they teach contrary to the scripture, okay? But prophecy or preaching is a gift from the Holy Spirit. But if you're standing in the pulpit and you're preaching contrary to the word of God, that is not a gift, that is a curse. Matthew 24, let me fi finish reading it. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Yeah, Miss Shelley, I know, not, not, not me. I, I appreciate that. And so when you look at what Paul's saying, you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, Paul is talking about, he's talking about the gift of prophecy or the gift of preaching. There is a gift, okay? There's a lot of people that want to be able to preach. Man, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time. There, there's guys, they can't preach themselves out of a wet paper bag. I mean, it's just... You know, and preaching is not necessarily about running and hollering and screaming. Preaching is about opening the word, opening your mouth, and speaking the truth. We were at a camp meeting in Conway, Arkansas, several years ago, and uh, there was an it was actually a Southern Baptist meeting, but uh, we were invited to go, and uh, we were invited to go sing, and so we were there. And uh, every time a preacher would get up and start preaching on the King James Bible, boy, they would just shout and holler and run the pews and just, I mean, like a bunch of wild men. Well, this old preacher, I mean, he was probably in his 80s. He got up there. He never raised his voice. He never, he never moved. And he preached on repentance and I'm telling you what, a hush fell across that place and I wanted to crawl under 
under the pew. I mean, it was my wife and I, we were under so much conviction. And that crowd wouldn't give him the time of day. They didn't give him a time of day. They did not, not acknowledge anything that he had said. But he preached. Absolutely preached. My friend, Brother Rick Crouch, last, last Sabbath, Brother Rick preached a, a great message. Brother Rick's not a, he's not a dynamic, you know, you know, in your face kind of thing. He, he reads his sermon, but it was chock full of meat. That's what preaching is. And it's a gift being able to open your mouth and be able to share the truth uh, of, of the father's word. And uh, it's very important. Very important. Now let's continue on. Uh, he says there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number uh, 10. And Miss K, we're getting to this one right here. To another the working miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. Now this is a very interesting one and one that, that uh, 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 it takes, I would say that it takes um, much caution Discernment of spirits would be judging spiritual matters. Now, Miss Kay, I, I don't have your your first comment. Uh, I can't pull it back up, but I but I remember. I think I think what uh, what you're you're talking about is when you know something about someone you haven't been told, and the spirit gives you inclination. I think that goes different than knowledge. That's spiritual discernment. Okay. That is, that is discerning of things that have not been told to you specifically, but that the Spirit has given you instruction in your mind and in your heart. That's a gift. That's a gift. But it is a, it is a very, very, very powerful gift that many times can be misused and misappropriated if we're not careful. Very, very important. Judging spiritual matters. There's been many times in my life uh, I, I have experienced that discernment. Yes, bro, Brother Keith, of testing the spirits. I've had spiritual discernment about certain things, and, I, and I've, I've shared with you know someone that might be with me or, or going into a particular area or my wife or somebody, and, and, and I would say, hey, the spirit just checked me on this. This is, this is not a good thing. We need to we need to adjourn from here. We need to back off, or or be listening to someone tell a story, or listen to someone talk, or even listening to a preacher and the spirit check you and say that's not right. That's that's in, that's in, incorrect. And all of a sudden the spirit start telling you things about that individual that you did not otherwise know. <clears throat> There's been times in my ministry as I would preach and people would come up to me after the service and, and after the message and they would say, I want to know who told you that. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talk, talking about. Y you was preaching and you you mentioned something that just took place in my life just the other day and I won't know who told, told, told you that. I said, well, it must have been the Holy Spirit. I said, because I have no idea what you're talking about. That's discerning of spiritual matters. And that is a gift that comes only from the Spirit. You can't manufacture that. You can't work that up. I mean, you can't conjure that up. You can't have a crystal ball, tarot cards, rocks, uh, 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 jewels, or you know, stones, or whatever. You can't do that. That comes strictly from the Spirit of God. Okay? Miss Kay, did that answer your question? I, I see a yep there on the screen, and I'm guessing that that's what you were talking about. And that's a spiritual gift that Paul talks about. And, and all of these gifts are given to the assembly. Understand this. The spiritual gifts are given only to the assembly, only to the believer. And they're to be used for the Father. They're to be used for the, for the assembly. They're to be used for the furtherance of the gospel and the furtherance of the ministry to grow the body and to grow the assembly and to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. They're not to be used for financial gain. They're not to be used for filthy lucre. They're not to be used for extortion purposes. But they're to be used to benefit the assembly because that's what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about this whole thing about the assembly. 
Now he goes on to say, not only discerning of spirits, but to another, uh, to, to another different kinds of tongues. Okay. Now, uh, and, and also to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead. We'll deal with this again probably in a couple weeks. But I want to jump ahead to chapter number 14 in this letter because Paul deals with this. And I'm just going to tell you right now, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of false teaching and false practice when it comes to tongues. Okay? Now, our Pentecostal friends and our Assemblies of God and our charismatic uh, groups, they are, that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to recreate Acts 2 every Sunday. Recreate Pentecost every Sunday. Guess what? That was one time event. Okay? That was one time. It was one time. That particular event was a one time event of that magnitude. You're not going to manufacture that. I don't care what you do. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to manufacture the gifts of tongues and the gifts of interpretation of tongues. I want you to look over to 1 Corinthians 14. And, and I want to show you some guidelines. The whole chapter deals with the gift of tongues. But I'm going to just show you some things, and I'm going to sort of kind of skip around. I don't want to skip around too much because I may lose the context. Um, verse 1, and, and I may have to end up reading the whole thing. Um, let me read it from the Peshitta, chapter 14, verse 1. Run after love and be zealous for the gifts of the Spirit, but especially that you may prophesy. There's that prophecy again, that preaching, okay? For whoever speaks in languages does not speak to men, but he is speaking to Elohim. For no man understands what he speaks, but by the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, encouragement, and comfort to the children of men. Okay? So tongues, when you're speaking in other languages, you're not edifying men. You you're, you're are, are speaking mysteries. But when you preach or prophesy or teach or any type of ex expounding on the word, it says that you're speaking edification, encouragement, and comfort to the children of men. Now, look at what it says. Verse 3. He who speaks in languages builds himself up. And he who prophesies builds the assembly up. All right. I wish that all of you might speak in languages, but all the more that you may prophesy. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in languages unless he translates. But if he translates, he translates, he edifies the assembly. Now, when you look at this and you look at what the Pentecostals do and the, and the churches of God and the charismatics, my friend, Brother Keith calls them charismatics. Okay. Whenever, whenever they get in there, they, they say that they're speaking in a heavenly language, an unknown tongue. There is no such thing as an unknown tongue. The Bible never talks about an unknown tongue. In the book of Acts, chapter number 2, they spoke 16 or 17 different, there were 17 different languages. Therefore, Shavuot, for the day of Pentecost, and Peter preached one message, and 17 different, different languages heard it and understood it. Wasn't, it wasn't an unknown tongue or a gibberish or an angelic tongue. That's a bunch of gar a garbage. That's out of the pits of hell. Let me continue on. Verse 6, And now, my brethren, if I come to you and speak languages with you, what do I benefit you unless I shall speak with you either by revelation or knowledge or by prophecy or by teaching? Uh, as a as a property inspector in Kansas, I ran across a lot of Hispanic people that I could not communicate with. Now, Brother Edgar Vizcaino and Miss Margarita, they taught me some Spanish so that I could communicate with those folks on the street. And I remember preaching down in Donna, Texas, down on the border of Mexico and Texas, and the church that I preached at, well, half of it was, was Spanish speaking and half of it was English. And I preached with an interpreter, and that was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Life. Hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Yes, Miss Shelley, I believe the gibberish is witchcraft. 
I think it is witchcraft. Let me go on. Verse number seven. For even inanimate things which give sound, whether a flute or a harp, if they make no distinction between one tone or another, how will anything that is played or anything that is harped be known? For if a trumpet make a sound which is not distinct, who will be prepared for the battle? So you also, if you will say words and languages and you will not translate, how will anything be known that you say, for you yourselves will be as one who is speaking to the air? For behold, there are many kinds of languages in the world, and there is not one of them without sound. And if I do not know the import of the sound, I am a foreigner to him who speaks, and also he who speaks is a foreigner to me." <clears throat> So also, so also you, because you are zealous of the gifts of the Spirit, seek to excel for the edification of the assembly. And he who speaks in languages, let him pray to translate. And so remember what Paul said back in chapter number 12. Uh, he said there that there was a gift of languages or tongues, diversities or different kinds of tongues, and the gift to translate tongues or the interpretation of tongues. Verse number 14, chapter 14 and verse 14. For if I should pray in languages, my spirit is praying, but my understanding is unfruitful. Unfruitful, very important word. Our, our, uh, our, our uh, authorized Bible, uh, King, King James Bible says there in verse number 14, uh, it is um, uh, understanding is unfruitful, also unprofitable. Verse 15, what therefore shall I do? Shall I pray with my spirit and I shall pray also with my understanding? I shall sing with my spirit and I shall sing also with my understanding. Otherwise, if you say a blessing in the spirit, how will he who fills the place of the unlearned say amen for your giving of thanks? Because he does not know what you said. For you bless well, but your neighbor is not edified. I thank Elohim that I am not speaking in languages more than all of you. But in the assembly, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may instruct others also than 10,000 words in languages. My brethren, do not be children in your intellects, but be infants in evil and be fully mature in your intellects. It is written in the Torah or in the law with foreign speech and with other language I shall speak with this people and not even in this way will they hear me, says the Lord Yahweh. So then languages are established for a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. But prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. If therefore it should happen that the whole assembly assembles and everyone would speak in languages and the uninitiated or the unlearned or those who are unbelievers should enter, would they not say that such have gone insane? But if all of you would prophesy and the unlearned or the unbeliever should enter, he is searched out by all of you and he is reproved by all of you. And the secrets of his heart are revealed and then he will fall on his face and worship Elohim and he will say, truly Elohim is in you. And I say therefore, my brethren, that whenever you gather, whoever among you has a psalm, let him speak. Or whoever has a teaching, or whoever has a revelation, or whoever has a language, or whoever has a translation, let it all things be done for edification. And if any speak in languages, let two speak, or as many as three, and let each one speak, and let one translate. If there is no translator, let him who speaks in a language be silent in the church or in the assembly, and let him speak to himself and to Elohim. How many times in these, in these Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches do they just start jump up, start blabbering everything, and there's no translation? We have no idea what they said. He says, verse 29, but let two or three prophets speak and the others discern. And if something is revealed to another while the first is sitting, let him be quiet. For you can all prophesy one by one that each person may teach and everyone may be comforted. For the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Because Elohim is not chaotic but peaceful as in all the assemblies of the holy ones. Now here's the key. Let your women be silent in the assemblies for they are not allowed to speak but to be in subjection just as the written law also says. And if they wish to learn anything, let them ask their husbands in their homes for it is a shame for women to speak in the assembly. Now somebody tell me in these charismatic churches what is what percentage what percentage 
of the people are speaking in tongues? Is it a higher percentage of men or is it a higher percentage of women? I'll give you a few minutes or a few seconds to answer that question. Is it a higher percentage of men or a higher percentage of women? And as the Jeopardy song goes, do, 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 do. My aunt, I love her to death. She's gone. She's passed on. Women, that's exactly right. Women, Miss Leone, you win tonight. You're the first one with the answer. Women. And the Bible is very clear that women are to be silent. This entire context in 1 Corinthians 14 is dealing with the speaking of tongues and languages within the assembly. And women are to keep their mouths shut and not do such things. Look at what Paul, Paul goes on to, to, to say why. Look, look at what he says. Verse number 36, or did the word of Elohim come forth from you or does it come from uh, un, unto you alone? But if any of you thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, let him know that these things I write to you are the commandments of our Lord. Who was the first in, in the transgression? Thank you, Miss Kay. Take care. Who was the first in the transgression? Eve was. It was the woman. It was the one. And look, I don't have a thing against ladies. Please don't take me wrong. I'm married to one. I have two of them that are daughters, okay? I, I love them dearly. I had a mother and a mother-in-law. I love them dearly. But there are certain places that and certain things that are not appropriate and things that are not to take place. And Paul is very clear. The scripture is very clear and the Bible is very clear that women are to be silent concerning in, in, the, in the tongues and in the speaking of tongues and they are to be silent and if they want to learn something they need to learn from their husbands but it's the men and the leaders of the assembly that are to prophesy and that are to speak in languages and that are to translate. Now Brother Keith, one of our men, uh, he speaks almost, now correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Keith, he speaks almost fluent Hebrew, okay? And so a lot of times, I'll have him do the Shema or do the benediction in, in Hebrew. Yes, yes, Abba has order in all things. That's why, that, that's why the scripture is very clear, let everything be done decently and in order, okay? Um, Brother Keith, whenever he does the Shema or whether he does a particular reading in Hebrew, he always translates it. I mean, he's not only the, he's not only the, the speaker of languages, but he's also the interpreter because none of us can interpret, okay? But he, he does that because he's been given that gift. He has that gift. He speaks fluent Hebrew and just, I mean, just puts us to shame. But nevertheless, he always translates whenever he speaks Hebrew, he always translates in English what he said. And so it's very important that we keep that in mind that all all of this is to be done decently and in order okay now I want you to go back I want you to go back to chapter number 12 and we're going to try to try to finish this thing up as best as possible verse uh, verse number 11 Paul says uh, and I'm going back to the Peshitta again Paul says in verse 11 but all these things that one spirit does and distributes to every person as he pleases. For in like manner, because the body is one and there are many members in it, while all of them are many members, they are one body, thus also is the Messiah. For we also are baptized by the one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Aramaeans or servants or free men, and we are all made to drink the one spirit. For also the body is not one member, but many. Don't stop right there. Your body has many different parts and many different functions. There's a lot of people that want to be the head. Okay. They want to be the head. They have a, they have a, a desire uh, for the preeminence. Uh, Paul said Diotrephes, I believe it was Diotrephes, uh, Demas had forsaken me, and I believe it was Diotrephes who desired the preeminence. I believe it was Diotrephes. 
<clears throat> there are those that want to usurp th of authority and position because they think it's a, it's a place of power. But if everybody was ahead, how's the body going to move without legs and feet? If everybody was hands, how's, ever, uh, how's the body going to function without arms? So everybody, everybody has different parts for different functions. That's what Paul's talking about. And he's using the body, the physical body, as the illustration to give the picture as for the assembly. Look at what he says there in verse number 15. For if a foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? For if all the body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if all were hearing, how would there be smell? But now Elohim has set everyone in the members, every one of the members in the body, just as he has chosen. There's the key. If, if Elohim has placed you as a backbone in the assembly to help carry the load, then, then bloom where you're planted. If Elohim has, has blessed you with, with, with the, the legs of the assembly that you can go and you can minister, then bloom where you're planted and do the, do the, the function that Elohim has, has created you to do. If he's given you the gift of, uh, of, of speech and he's given you the gift to preach or to prophesy then do that and use that gift because yes brother Daniel we're all one unit that's exactly right we're all one unit I have a lot of different parts of my body but I am one body I am one David Jones and y'all better not say amen right there <laughs> the world does not need another one amen but look at what Paul goes on to say Verse 17, for if all the body were an eye, where would the hearing be? See, a discerner would be one who had ears. A, a prophet would be one that could speak. Okay? It said, and if all were hearing, how would there be smell? But now Elohim has set everyone in the, uh, of the members in the body just as he has chosen but if they were all one member, where's the body? If they were all one, if they're all a bunch of hands, no body. But now there are many members, but the body is one. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you. Neither can the, hands, the head say to the feet, I do not need you. But all the more those members that are considered weak, on the contrary, are needful. And though, see, I've got things on my body that are weak. My knees... My knees are giving out on me, but I thank, thank the Lord I've still got knees. Amen. My, my toes and my feet hurt from time to time, but I still thank, thank the Father I've still got toes and feet. Okay. My eyesight's going bad. Okay. But I still thank, thank the Father that I've got eyes that I can see. Okay. Those are weak parts, but yet I still need them. I had to have a root canal fixed. And I thank the Father all day long that I've still got my, all my original teeth. Amen. He says, verse 22, but the, all the more those members that are considered weak, on the contrary, are needful. And those which we think are shameful in the body, we increase greater honor on, on, the, uh, on these. And for those that are contemptible, we make greater attire. But those members which we honor do not need honor. For Elohim unites the body, and he has given greater honor to the small members, lest there would be divisions in the body, but all the members should be caring equally one for another. So now when one member shall suffer, all of them shall share the pain. And if one member rejoices, all the members shall rejoice. But you are the body of the Messiah and members in your places. For Elohim has set first in his assembly apostles, after them prophets, after them teachers, after them miracle workers, after them gifts of healing, helpers, leaders, different languages. Are they all apostles? Are they all prophets? Are they all teachers? Are they all miracle workers? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all of them speak with languages or do all of them translate? But if you are zealous of, for great gifts, I again shall show you a better way. And then he goes right into the love chapter in chapter number 13. So when we look at this and we understand the gifts and spiritual things 
they are just that spiritual things now i want to talk a little bit about those offices he talked about apostles and prophets apostle now we've been taught in our baptist circles that an apostle is only one of the 12 but i would differ i would disagree with that an apostle simply means a messenger or one who is sent that's what the that's what the concordance says that a, an apostle is yes it can relate to the 12 apostles but but an apostle is one a messenger or one that is sent to do a to do a job I was sent to Kansas to start assemblies and it was there that father opened my eyes to greater truth and therefore I, I, I guess I could be considered an apostle you may disagree, that's fine, but I'm just going by, by what the definition is. Apostle is a messenger. A prophet is one who speaks by inspiration. A teacher is one who has ability to teach. Miracle workers are the power and ability to do miracles. Healing are remedies and medicines, and helpers are there to aid or to assist. By the way, all ministries need helpers, amen? All ministers need helpers and all ministries need helpers. All assemblies need helpers. It is not right for one or two people to do everything, okay? It's not right. It's not the way Elohim decided it to be. The leaders, our governments and managers, all ministries and all assemblies need gifts, right? Gifts, not things, right? The, all assemblies need leaders, those who are managers and those that can govern accordingly. And then, of course, the different languages, the ability to learn and speak various languages is a great benefit within the assembly because of, of you know, different, different uh, people coming in from different places. You, you never know who you're going to run into. But the assembly is worldwide. It's not just in one location or not just in one house or not just in one city or one county. The, the assembly is worldwide. And there are people all over the world who are a part of the assembly. They've been baptized into, into Yeshua and are in covenant with the Father through Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ the righteous. And the assembly is worldwide, okay? And so it's important for us to understand that where we are in our assembly, we need to use the gifts that Father has given us that we may be a blessing and a benefit to our assembly. Amen? When you look at the scriptures and you read what Paul says and you read how Paul wrote this and interpreted it from the Torah and from the, from the original covenant, you'll see that it's important for us to understand spiritual things. Understand that those spiritual things come only from the Holy Spirit. Amen. And next week we're going to get into chapter 13. We're going to, because it transitions right from chapter 12, right into chapter 13. Of course, then right back into chapter 14, which we dealt with a little bit tonight. And we're going to get into that next, next week. Amen. Hello, Dalen. Appreciate you joining us. I'm just getting off the air. Amen. Hey, listen, thank you all. Listen, tomorrow is our Sabbath fellowship, two o'clock. Uh, if you're in the Salisbury, North Carolina area, come and join us. We'll be glad to have you. Uh, make sure to go to to your assembly tomorrow. Make sure to take, take a day of rest. It is commanded in the scriptures. Genesis chapter number two. Uh, Yahweh rested from his labors and he established the Sabbath from creation to be observed forever. So have a great Sabbath day. May the Lord richly bless you is our prayer. We'll see you next time. Amen.